Now transition to your work at Google. So you're leading transportation strategy and partnerships. So what does using Google's vast resources for the public good look like in practice? Mm. Well, you know, Sophia, I wanted to take a step back because I am a dedicated public servant. I am third generation from public servants in my own family. And I really struggled with how to learn about the technology in the private sector. Because for nearly two decades, I've been on the public sector side trying to innovate, trying to partner with technology companies. And sometimes they wouldn't always meet my expectations. And it would go back to what we were talking about earlier about product market fit or not really understanding the problem we were trying to solve. And so when I was about to end my tenure at the Department of Transportation in the Federal Highway Administration, I realized I can't continue to critique the tech sector if I'm not willing to be a part of the tech sector and learn it firsthand. And so that was one of the things I, I think I would love for more of us to do is whether you're in the tech sector, try and learn government. If you're in government, try and learn the private sector, because that's the only way we're going to have true, strong public private partnerships that drive safe transportation solutions. Um, and I've been really proud at Google is that we're very mission driven. Google public sector, my part of Google was founded a little over three years ago because they realized Alphabet and Google have enormous resources and we should be using those to serve public mission like transportation safety, protecting vulnerable road users, preventing climate risks from impacting communities like they have been. And the two things I love about Google and learning in my first nearly year here is they use and champion human centered design, which is asking what is the problem we're trying to solve and engaging stakeholders. And the second is they have this beautiful model at Google called think big, act small and stay humble. And the idea is we're solving really big problems. Transportation safety, you know, vision zero has been around for a long time and we still haven't eliminated road fatalities, but that doesn't mean we can't act. And so we try and take little small parts of the problem statement that we try and achieve. And we just have to have fun and be humble to do that. Because if you come in any room with ego, you're not going to be listening or learning. Over the course of the podcast, I still have a couple more questions, but I've been very, very, very inspired about your mission-driven and moral-driven view when when attacking anything. It's very important, right? And I, again, I'll be excited for the next podcast when I get to hear what your vision oh. statement is. <laughs> I'll work on that. I need to work on that. So how do you see AI, data analytics, and digital infrastructure transforming how cities plan and manage mobility over the next decade? Well, this question is certainly the big question, I think, that we're all asking. And I'll offer just, you know, a few personal and professional thoughts here. First is the hype curve is real, right? There is a lot of hype around these technologies. And some companies, you know, are maybe increasing the hype. Um, and I think we just need to manage expectations, right? Any new technology takes time to evolve, right? The the iPhone came out uh, circa 2007, and it wasn't ubiquitous for a while, right? And it took us time to learn a new haptic and tap technology. So we just have to recognize we need to learn it, but it takes time, and there's going to be failure. And that's okay, as long as you're managing your expectations. Um, the second is we should all be trying it. So I'm learning how to create my own agents. I use generative AI and, and Gemini every single day to develop reports, to answer emails to automate very basic tasks that otherwise take a lot of administrative time. And that, Sophia, then frees up uh, our critical thinking skills, right? We're able to use our most basic human skills like empathy, listening, creative problem solving, um, critical analysis. And, and that's where we should be spending a lot of our time. And lastly, I'm really excited because in a couple of weeks, uh, Google is launching what we're calling Google for Transportation, which is identifying our top 20 plus or minus AI priorities over the next few years, because there's a lot of things that AI can do from predicting where crashes are going to be and, and hopefully preventing them from happening to protecting vulnerable road users, to preventing work zone workers from getting uh, killed or struck in work zone construction. And it can do a lot of different things. In the resiliency side, we now have AI and weather analysis that can help predict flooding five days in advance which has, would have saved lives during hurricanes Helene and Milton last year. We also have AI that can even manage assets better. And when we talk about assets, we're talking about things even from big bridges, like the Francis Scott Key Bridge that collapsed after a collision or an elision last year, to even just, is there a pothole in your road? Or does that airport runway need resurfacing? Every one of these things is a piece of the puzzle that's gonna make our transportation system more safer and resilient, and hopefully better for every community member that we, we get to talk to. 
Absolutely. Well, the future is very, very exciting. So looking ahead, what excites you most about the intersection of technology, policy and community in building a safer, more sustainable transportation ecosystem? Honestly, I have to say, Sophia, it's it's conversations like this. I am in my mid 40s and I'm just so thrilled that much smarter people like you are interested in this space and are going to help us overcome some of these really challenging problems that have plagued us for decades. And so I feel like it's our obligation to make sure that you have all the resources, the networks and the tools you need to, to achieve what you want to achieve, because you really can. The future is extraordinarily opportunistic right now with the advent of AI and technology. I think the second thing I'd love to see more of is people leaning in to roles like, like mine, where you're coming from the public sector into private sector innovation. And I'd love to see more people from the private sector going into government innovation. And that's where truly we can understand the problem statements and move more um, in a more agile manager man manner. Uh, we know government doesn't always isn't always known for moving the fastest. And that's because we have to manage the risk of everyone that we serve. And yet there's an opportunity to take on some of that risk as a former government lawyer. I can assure us we can be more agile uh, while doing better for the communities we serve. And then I really hope that we continue to empower public agencies and empower the public servants within them. They have a lot on their plates. They are under-resourced. They're overworked. And so I'm just hoping that more of us in the tech sector can come with more humility And the idea that we want to co-build and co-create solutions rather than just develop a widget and sell it to a customer. That's not the future. The future is conversation and co-creation. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me. I learned so much and I'm feeling so much more inspired now after talking to you. So thank you so much. Thank you much, Sophia, for your podcast. And thank you for all of your interest and passion around this topic. We just need so many more of you and whatever we can do to support you, you let us know.